Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. You can hang out afterwards, too. So, yeah. <laughs> Keep chatting. Um, this is really um, exciting and amazing. Um, thank you for being here. It's an incredible pleasure to welcome Claire Cruz and Amani Elizabeth Jackson. Um, thanks to you both for being here for this reading and for a workshop that happened this afternoon, Woven Line. Um, I'm Mike Went, I'm the program director here at Woodland Pattern. Um, and also hello out there on Crowdcast. I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement statement and say that we at Woodland Pattern acknowledge that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin, Sovereign, Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the act of dismantling of white supremacy. Um, I just have some announcements and then we can get this rolling. Um, the first is that I hope you'll visit uh, the bookstore just generally because um, there's a lot out there uh, you can get lost in. But specifically we also have some um, journals, anthologized publications, other things that in particular um, Amani has work in and um, they're pretty terrific. So. Um, and as well as some books sort of that are related to the, the um, workshop. So. Um, this will close out programs for this month, um, but join us again in December when we are, uh, it's like a month of celebrating new publications, so that's exciting. We've got on December 6th, we'll welcome um, Sean Enfield celebrating his essay collection, um, a Holy American Burnout from Split Lip Press. Um, and that'll be Sean in um, uh, reading with, with a few other folks, I think seven people on that bill. So it'll be a nice gathering of, of wonderful humans and writers. Um, December 7th, the very next day, we'll celebrate a short story collection from R.S. Deeren, who um, in addition to being a Terrific writer, also um, is a dear friend and made significant contributions to Woodland Pattern when he was living here in Milwaukee. So it'll be nice to welcome him back. And then closing out the month and year for our literary programs um, will be a celebration of issue three of the QWERTY Quarterly, which is the official publication of QWERTY Fest Milwaukee, which is a festival celebrating the QWERTY keyboard, which was invented here in Wisconsin. Um, so an annual fest in celebration. Um, so, uh, and they have, so they have a, yeah, quarterly sort of zine that they publish. And, um, that'll be a great time. Uh, some readings and other, other fun um, with organizers, fest organizers, Molly Snyder and T. Krulos, among others. So. Um, and I think that's the announcements. So um, now I'm going to move into um, uh, the, the joy of introducing um, Claire and Amani, who will introduce at the same time. Um, oh, I guess I should say that this event taking place today, uh, or the events taking place today, are part of um, our Unwriting Border series, uh, with thanks to the NEA for the support um, of that series of these events. The series had fe has featured um, readings and other events exploring uh, diasporic borders, ecotone borders, linguistic borders, um, all of which are present in Jackson and or Cruz's work, um, but most present perhaps or maybe most relevant given the nature of the events today um, are the borders of material and process. The borders, for instance, of language itself, as in the writing of Amani Elizabeth Jackson, who to borrow from the introduction to weaving language, one lexicon, lexicon, quote, assembles words as threads that enter into the weaving, or from flag, quote, eucalyptus, eyelid, elide, or the borders between physical media, 
what can be predicted and what can't, as Claire Cruz says, of a series of compositions on paper made by running woven and inked cloth through an intaglio press. Quote, making this work feels like preparing for what is to come when what is to come is unknowable. Both are engaged in creation, or creative practices predicated upon flux and upon the disruption of other non-material borders, temporal, spatial, sensory, again from flag, quote, where I live is a shifting line. Or to consider a question from Jackson and Cruz's workshop this afternoon, how do both text and textile engage with memory, with place? Um, we're thrilled then to welcome two artists giving careful attention to the sensory experience of materials, their relationship to memory, history, and interiority, and ultimately, the way all of these considerations become fundamental to a thoughtful and engaged life, even a practice of self-care and preservation, to borrow once more from Cruz, an idea that seems, I think, to apply to both artists joining us this evening. Quote, I make this work with the feeling that adaptability is a requirement for survival. It's a real pleasure to welcome first Claire Cruz, followed by Imani Elizabeth Jackson. Thank you to everyone at Woodland Pattern for being such generous hosts to us the last couple days. Um, in particular to Mike Went, who has been our kind of point person and coordinator over the last month. And to those of you who participated in the workshop this afternoon. And to Amani for being a friend and collaborator in these projects. I am going to read a single piece this evening um, that I wanted to return to because the themes felt relevant to today and today's events. And I wrote it during a time when I was working at a sheep and cattle ranch in far southern Arizona and my truck was failing. And around that same time, I learned that ravel and unravel are synonyms. And it made me curious about ravel's relationship to the prefix un. Ravel, verb, raveled or raveled, raveling or raveling, one, a to let fall into a tangled mass as the threads of a fabric after pulling it apart. B, to make intricate, entangle, involve. Two, to separate or undo the texture of, unravel, untwist, unwind, unweave. Often used without or sometimes with off. Three, to undo the intricacies of, to make plain. One, A, to become entangled or confused. B, to make an investigation or search. Two, to become untwisted, unwoven, or unwound. Fray, also. One, ravel. I pump the tire jack, the sheep, Though near, take no interest in me. The sun is high, there is still time to put on the spare before the sun begins to set. I cannot remember the last time I changed attire, but I remember knowing how. With hands consumed, she moves the body of the horse beneath her with slight pressure from her thighs. A horse walks in a repeating arc slowly to guide the flock to another part of the field. The arc pendulums to a half circle, then grows smaller as the sheep settle into a new shape. There is a line between grazed and ungrazed. A soft margin surrounds them, kept by concentric movements of white dogs. Tumbleweeds find edges, accumulate there. A berm, pool of maroon afterbirth, 
wet and small body already woolen. I think at a distance, a rock is a lamb. She moves the flock away from the point on the road where I am. I had not gone far. While filling up the tank, I noticed a wetness rimming the tire. There had been no rains and no puddles to have passed through. On my hands and knees, I watch a small pool form near the inner rubber of the tire, forming from a drip of condensed liquid off one strut. I touched the pool with my fingers and smelled, expecting gasoline. But there was no smell or viscosity or yellow hue. I touched the wheel well, shiny with liquid, and there was no smell and only red flecks of dust. Out of habit, I inspected the fuel tank. I retrieved a white terry cloth rag from the glove compartment and unfolded and folded to find a blank square that I wiped along the chrome where the paint had been stripped from the gas tank. But the tank was matte dry, the patch unsaturated, and the cloth came back clean. I could see the weld where the new muffler was attached to a long exhaust pipe extending behind the one remaining catalytic converter. Like a stack of dimes is how he described the texture, the way the weld should turn out, like a stack of dimes. I opened the hood and checked the fluids and found the brake fluid low. I could not find the origin of the liquid but wondered if there was a leak. I bought a canister of fluid and filled the reservoir and got back on the road going east. Two, Un. I thought I had asked Un to meet me at the corner bar for a drink, but being here, I couldn't remember if I had or only thought I had. Had Un already been? Un said she would meet me there, I was almost sure of. Where was Un? I tried to read, but the pages were all a swarm, swum marks in white heaven. Clouds come, clouds had come, but there was no un. So I left. I walked the distance, the short distance, in a far path. I made the short distance become much farther. I doubled back on each street. I walked on either long side of the streets between the bar and the place I was staying in. I ravel looking for un, or some evidence of un, but the streets were overgrown, the sidewalk edges ungrazed. I stopped only to ask anyone if they had seen un, told them of her flock, and drove her flock with her everywhere un was. They did not understand what I was asking. They did not know un, hadn't seen un. When I got to the motel, I was more alone than before. Home isn't where I was, I didn't know where. I looked inside a book to stay somewhere, couldn't sit. I stood in front of the open box of books with one foot on the ground and one foot on a low stool. I was rocking slightly, seeking comfort in the pages or a clue on how to be anywhere. So I tried to soothe the loop I was in, where doubt forms fog, rolls in, I read, sung, lung, rung, plunge. Was it possible that Un forgot, or that something happened? Or had Un decided not to come? Had I encountered Un at all? It wasn't that I expected to see her again. It wasn't that I thought I ever would. When we first met after long approach, her in motion with her flock and I in stillness with my truck, my tire. Un is a syllable. Un is an altering state, an altered state, the prefix of reversal, deprivation, or removal with exceptions. Un can indicate past tense as in unlocked. I walked the length of the river until a bridge was available to cross over it. To cross over, the action is the same in forward or reverse. Three, ravel. A moaning when the truck slows, a new moaning, louder, 
a drift is what the mechanic laser calls it, lapsing, soft brake, soft to the foot. The driver of the tow truck asks where the truck is from, and I say out east where they salt the roads without inflection. Rust perforates the frame over time and begins to flake. Salt has pitted through. The dry, mus the dry mud is what the frame resembles. Repairs can slip sideways when rust is present. Everything that we touch is breaking, no crumbling, the bolts stripped. There could be debris caught when the cylinder sprung a leak, when there was a hole in the hard line and the cylinder cracked. The system needs flushing. Rust was a foreign substance. I spoke to a man on the phone who put me on hold. The man said he would have to trek if they would take the job. These jobs, he said, can go sideways. He said that when things begin to break, to crumble, that they cannot be put back, what they disassembled. I am on hold and the cottonwood fur is slow in the air. I notice a new hole forming in the shoulder of my shirt. I feel the sun where my sleeve ends, where it finds my wrist. There is a red spot, a red sun spot on my wrist. The vein on the back of my hand bulging out, I think, the hands of an older woman. He says he is sorry. He says they won't take the job they couldn't quote for. Can't touch this one, he says. I speak to another man who puts me on hold. He uses the same phrase as the first man. He says, jobs like this can easily go sideways, can slip, can extend time. He just wants me to know that. I say, I understand and ask for a rough estimate. He says, could change. I describe to him the problems I was encountering, tried my best to describe the sounds. I knew then that I should have the truck towed. Not far from the riverbed, there are narrow-leafed willows, thick and sage-toned near the bank. I should have the car towed, now the brake has softened. I have pulled over due to a sound and see the wetness has spread and the reservoir is empty beneath the hood. I fill it with what fluid is left in one bottle. I have several squat empty bottles now of brake fluid, silver bottles with blue caps. Every gas station carries the same kind with checkers on the bottle like a racing flag. It was cold in the cab of the tow truck. He tells me this is the road they ride horses on during ceremony. He asks me if it is too cold. He tells me the bolts have corroded and fused with the shocks. They had to cut them out and exchange the bolts for a different size, he says, unrecognizable lump. I am on the phone, I am sitting in a red painted chair in the covered walkway outside the motel room facing across the parking lot to a busy road. On the far end of the lot, the man is painting the low stucco wall with a spray nozzle. The paint is a new clean layer the doors are red and white stucco. There are decorative patterns around each door and arcs. I wonder if he painted. It is good to watch him paint. He is wearing a sun hat. I am in the shade. There is a carport and a raised yellow speed hump at the entrance to the motel. He has a cloudy jug half full of water beside him. The man says to me that when the putty begins to warm is when the chemical reaction begins. You must work quickly so as not to get burned. His hands are those of a mechanic. Prince Black, he holds in one a coral-colored rag like it is a glove. He has a red shape on his cheek. Does it get so hot that a fire could ignite in the presence, presence of residual gas? No, it's more of a chemical heat. You only have to make sure the area is dry before you begin work, or else it will patch, dry, cure, then fall right off. He shows me an open package of the putty, what it will look like inside. There is a small white circle that may be used on the end of what amount is used to preserve what remains. He is still holding the shop rag in his left hand while he enters the sale. I want to ask him something else so that I can remain an explanation for longer. Four, 
un. The flock is a more or less coherent group, a soft-edged oval fit shifting slowly in the wide berth a white dog to a wider shape, passes between flock and field a slow perimeter, thick dog head, loft circle, mothered lamb close beneath, sheepfold, ritual. In moments, I recognize her as the same of me, as me, in fact, as myself, but I am confined by the situation, the press of the flat tire, and not linger in resemblances. My truck is up on the jack. I see the patch on the gas tank. The undercarriage of the car reveals its origin of winter of salted roads unfamiliar to hear, moldering the steel gradually in pitted rust. I lay for a moment in its shade. There are no other cars on this road. There has been no recent fire. The fuel load compact, the, gazing, the grazing fine. Familiar with the material, he was lying in a similar orientation to that which I am in now. It is undiscernible which prints belong to him or my gloved hand when I moved to his place and took over the putty radiating chemical heat through the blue latex, the softness, the ply stiffening beneath my touch, and soon I could no longer manipulate its gray surface, lumpy moon. I feared the tank wasn't drained for long enough, that some liquid may have come between the jagged hole and the patch, and that it could fall off without my knowing, the cure interrupted, and ignite a fire on a long drive. This fear I'd learned to live with, looking often underneath to check for its subtle bulge. I am relieved today that it has stayed, though it should not surprise me that was years ago. Soil disturbed beneath the car where my body was laying on the ground. It is not necessary to lay on the ground in order to change a tire. I only wanted to check the patch on the gas tank while I had it jacked up. I sit beside the suspended tire and use the crossbar to loosen the bolts on the hubcap. I can see her garments in layers. They are mostly white, holding a map of dust. Her hair is braided down between her shoulder blades. I am less sure that she is my sister, though we know each other somehow. I see a low rock and think it is a lamb. I place it gently in the bed of my truck. The pasture is a plenum. Dust coats my windshield, finds folds in her fabric. I remember my dream, a dog named Lamb. Slight symmetry, while you, I go, if the plates had on hadn't already given me away and the particulars of my dress. Was it the shoes or the wash of my denim? The beneath of my car gave me away. He was polite. He asked me where the car was from instead of asking me the same. Out east, he nodded. Five, Ravel. The voice of the man on the phone, the tone of corrosion had pitted the frame. I see a bird bath through the back window. The way curtains tell light, permeable blue shadow fold, not like water, but through. What is the common name of the small blue flower with scalloped leaves? Grows behind the motel, brings water to the bird bath in mugs, filled in the bathroom sink, climbs out of the window to do this. The bird bath is a broken oval reflected in the window, crosses four lanes for a burrito. I walked the path again to the bar where I thought I might see Un. I brought pen and paper, ordered a sotol. The bartender told me it tastes like rain on cement. I tried to keep the seat available to my left and wrote to Un, though I did not think I would send the letter. The ceilings were tall and there was a storm, the rains periodic. I stepped beneath awnings, the sidewalk was a line, holding close to the entryways. The walls held heat, indoor, outdoor hall. Un was not there. I thought, the rain may be. Un, you are my nearest and farthest point. He studied phosphorus, volcanic rock, malapai. Here the mud is red, what grows in gone ocean. Shadow move low mountain over, shadow dispersal and recombination. 
blue let, blue want, blue hum, blue rumble. The man at the bar reminded me of my father, indoor, outdoor hall, when it wasn't the summer anymore, animal need amplified, the mirror in mud, the mission in mud, with scaffolding, softened slope, intermediate wall and floor, press of a shadow, lightest touch, keep going. Then I am surprised by his good judge of character. He offers her a drink, something non-alcoholic. He apologizes for his trailer. She is wearing white. He apologizes again. She looks to nothing west. There was laundry to do, so I filled the tub basin. I had no liquid soap. I unpackaged a small bar from the rigid sill and frothed it beneath the stream. The water was skim milk. I agitated the collars as best I could and the ar armpits of my shirts. The tile was yellow around the edge of the tub. The room was small and decorated with thought. The phone rang while my hands were churning the bath. I could not answer but called the mechanic back. The mechanic said it was not him who had called, but the first break, break line went in as planned, he said swimmingly, but they tested the pressure in the lot, slamming brakes as hard as they could, and the right rear line broke through. The leak, he said, was preventative, holding fast the rest. Okay, I said. I laid down on the smooth bedspread and found a new knot in the viga. I opened a box with a few items for a kitchen, my own mug. I arranged the items atop the mini fridge and on the small desk where the phone and lamp were, everything on small rectangles of cloth, woven or embroidered, mostly maroon. This is where the truck broke down, the smell of mesquite in bloom. I heard her calling the dog's name. It was the name of my brother just before the sun broke. If it is in the cards, something that has entered my vocabulary, not ants, but their shadows, moving their dead across flagstone, and how a gaze can be just to the right of. Thank you. That was beautiful. I have tears in my eyes, but I'll try to hold back. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mike, for the invitation. Thank you to everyone for the invitation and for just being so kind to us on this visit. Um, yes, spoiling us. I feel. <laughs> um, yeah, and just giving us so much permission in terms of this reading, um, this workshop. Um, it's something we've been trying to do for a long time, and it feels really good to have this as a first home for it. Um, thank you, Claire, for doing this with me and for letting me do this with you and for your words and your friendship. Um, I'm going to read from a few things. I think the first thing will be something that is in process. Um, I think the name is Portrait of a Life After Death. So that's what we'll call it for now. And these are just excerpts from it. I don't know by what mechanism, but it seemed I had formed a root system where my head should have been. Before the transformation, I recall closing my eyes, regulating my breath, and minding as I had taken to doing each morning before the sun's arrival. And then there was light behind my eyes, a cool light, a light transmitting unknown colors and moods. When I came to, I heard a whisper somewhere above me. Now, wriggle your toes, the whisper said. Now, your fingers. Now, whenever you're ready, the whisper said. 
And I found with some effort that I could, and it seemed a miracle, though then somehow I looked and my fingers were as green as my toes and my eyes, nose, and mouth were steeped in soil. I should note that before the transformation, I had dug myself into a hole. Dear reader, you should know that I was from S. Those who know the place could know my origin simply by watching me walk. There is a particular gate we of S maintain. It is subtle but signature, our accent, and it is evident regardless of one's ability to walk. I could know another from S with attention to just a few paces in any location and at any speed. Dress, features, complexion, predilections, and manners of speech are irrelevant in identifying those from S. Outside of S, recognition is made known with a particular gesture, and the gestures return. I would describe these, the gesture and gait, but will not, that others from S might continue to avoid unwelcome detection. CC's secret. In a search once, I came across an account of an enslaved family. The children, who were fathered by the plantation owner, took to freedom in adulthood. The first three ran away one by one, and the fourth was emancipated in his 20s. Two children, in freedom, chose to live among their people, taking up color. Two children did not, passing for white. The children wrote to each other until one discontinued her correspondence. Years later, her brother, living in color and writing the account, did not know whether she was living or dead. She had passed into whiteness and faded into history. He spoke of the others, their standings and marriages, and he recalled a piece of his childhood. Quote, my very earliest recollections are of my grandmother. When she was about, when I was about three years old, she was sick and upon her deathbed I was eating a piece of bread and asked if she would have some. She replied, no, Granny doesn't want bread anymore. She shortly after breathed her last. I have only a faint recollection of her." End quote. Things were not as this, but as I read, I recollected. I am certain that she believed she was telling me before my memory could form but I recall with precision Cece, my great-grandmother, holding me, a baby still in swaddling cloth, her leaning over, her hoarse whisper, I left S, she said, when I was young, but I returned, and you will too, though most of us don't. And she lifted me up, gleeful in sharing the secret, and I seemed to float, and she caught me. I believe I could be a ghost, but I am not. The possibility arises that I could be because I am in the ground awaiting decomposition, but still my mind wanders. Even before the transformation, something like this was the case. Often, among strangers, my voice seemed to glide just beneath any wavelength of understanding and often audibility. I chatted and was met with puzzlement or was ignored, but I did not stop chatting, and so my presence was rendered atmospheric, the stuff of noise and not speech. Often I wondered what others could perceive of me. I believed I could have been a ghost, but I was not. Grasses can be so loud is one thing I've learned since the transformation occurred. The grasses around me, they chat all day, and it hurts me sometimes, my inability to join them. 
Mostly, I have been happy here, listening to their language, which is indecipherable to me, but certainly resonant. Sometimes, the whisper that accompanied the transformation returns. Now, wriggle your toes, the whisper says. Now, your fingers. Now, whenever you're ready, the whisper says. I remember that in the days I spent in Cece's garden, I grew attached to the notion that human life and plant life ought to be discreet. I kept the world straight with simple statements. I would sit out there in the dirt, pulling and planting and picking. Plants are plants and people are people, I would say to myself in a small voice. People are people and plants are plants. Plants are plants and people are people. And then, in the long of the days, the declarations would rearrange themselves. Plants are plants, and people are people. Plants are people, and people are plants. Plants are people, peopling people. Plants are people, peopling plants. My words would become as I sat digging with my fingers in the soil. I think I said this earlier, but grasses really can be so loud. At this moment, they are rushing around me, tickling at what I believe to be my legs and feet, and I believe that I might be tangling in their lengths. When the grasses and I interact like this, I like to imagine that they know me, are shielding me, are teaching me language, are bringing me in on their fun. And then my mind wanders, considering the fate and activities of grasses elsewhere. And I wonder how their blades around graves feel. Do they take seriously their roles as vigil holders? Do they, do they mourn with the bereft? Do they miss their friends and enemies, the ones who were lost to the plots? Surely some of them grow bored or lonely or maintain a desire to be elsewhere for I do not know that the dead can speak or play in registers familiar to grasses. Slow down now. Sometimes I wish it were possible to weep, but being submerged head first in soil, I satisfy myself with what I suppose are secretions. The position I am in has generally required a fresh perspective and alternate ways of relating to my body. I wonder, as I am rooted now, if there is anyone who looks at me with recognition. Do I have that gait anymore? Do those who would know, know it? This being is from S, but unlike anything I have ever seen before, they might think. How odd, they might say, trying to decipher the situation. And then, tentatively, they might perform our gesture and sit with me, awaiting my reply. Next, I'm going to read from a chat book that I put out earlier this year, yes, <laughs> um, called Context for Arboreal Exchanges um, with Belladonna. And I guess I should say about this one, um, one of my aunts is a poet, um, Angela Jackson. And yeah, she has a good number of poet, poems about trees. And among those poems uh, are a few about a catalpa tree that was in the backyard of the house that yeah, my whole dad's side grew up in. Um, so she has all of these memories of that tree, which, you know, I also knew as a child and is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think I just started to think about that tree and that whole family of trees um, and wanted to see where I could go that she hadn't. 
could help her. So one thought seeded one other, and one vein then went tapping, and the tap went shooting down to come up one heart, three, then 17 hearts, 17 hearts, green hearts, extending hearts, enough to make up a tree full. And the tap went also exclaiming one inner heart, this inner one and open one, shaped of two ears touching, the parts snailed in, clustered and willing, clustered and willing to bloom as a game heart does, each part listening for the season's new arrangements. Contact can't be attempted. They speak to you or they don't. The offering, offering of a heart, will come through the nose and mouth with the seasons beneath the thinking senses. What I thought, what I thought I knew I did have to come to, what I thought I knew I did have to come to know, I think I grew, I think I grew into an awareness of these trees, not just birches, when I listened. When I listened, they breathed how they stood. They stood for something outside their root stability. Cut down rather harshly, the heart grows larger. One heart, three, then 17 green hearts branching here, casting deep shade. Vibrational living occurs between two or more swaying through their open ears, which makes for sonic bliss and ire. I've lost interest in potential and grown attached to what is happening, the present happening and its back matter. Always this, always this red influence, always this red influence of another tree falling on me and spilling out forms of letters and uneven cloths. A wing-headed leaf sprouting early is no sign worth singing except a dirge, perhaps. Constantly, I am learning in the most immediate ways, walking through the heat of February and touching bark in the street. Elation, the learned response for our exchange's plural effect. Catalpas. So imagine that my eye could achieve the precise intellect of a laser scanning system, perceiving these temporal tracks. I want to stand. I want to stand nightly amid a stand of trees possibly birches, and observe their minute shifts in posture. My parsing of my kinship to these trees 
is sensed by a crude understanding of the twin paradox, racial weathering. The tree stands. The tree stands so still, so quick in time, aging, I think, so slowly. Relatively, I'm always in motion, my skin falling off for new life as dust's particulates. What I would do to vanquish this weathering, the house destoried in an uncontrolled burn. The shrubs here, though, they remind me of then. Touching branches, they held on to me, small pieces broken off into my pointer finger. Look, I indexed the stars. Look, I pointed to the highway. New skin grew around the branches. Everything that was real remains real. She, then I, gathered you into a poem where you did not die, not yet. Your face a sapling in hers, growing in mine. Slowly living, you were slowly living. Your hearts extended by the physical qualities of light and healthy soil. Me in your shade, I grew patient. There comes, there comes a sign. There comes a sighing wind. There comes a sighing wind. Thank you. Claire, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, thanks to all of you here and all of you out there. To those of you here, uh, I invite you to stick around and enjoy the good company and have a good night all. Thanks.